Good evening. Let us commence to begin to get started with prayer. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we give you thanks for that which you have wrought in our lives daily. We recognize, Father, you have a purpose and plan, and we try to stay sensitive to that. We pray for an ability to understand your word tonight as we study it together, to understand how it applies to our lives, and Father, the empowerment of your Holy Spirit to not only instruct us, but to empower us. We pray for each one as we come aside from the activities of the day that we might focus upon you and upon your word. And give you thanks for grace that is sufficient for every need that we encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, this evening we pick up where we left off last week. If I can recall where that was. We were looking at four different techniques that are identified in the Bible of our living the Christian life. And we identify these four techniques as they are related directly to four specific crowns that are going to be awarded at the judgment seat of Christ to each believer. We mentioned in our introduction last time that there are two types of crowns that are identified for us in the scripture. And then in the course of the question and answer period, we identify, well, maybe there are a couple of other types that we need to talk about. But I say there are two types of crowns. I'm referring to the Greek text in which we have the word crown translated from the word diadem, and we have the word crowns translated from the word stephanos. So in the Greek, they make a distinction between the two. Now, in our question and answer period last week, we did note that there is an incorruptible crown and there is a corruptible crown. And that, of course, relates to the diadem. And uh, that crown is incorruptible. It fadeth not away. That's not a type of crown. It's simply identifying a characteristic or a quality of that crown. And they do that in, in language uh, that's done with the use of uh, uh, various parts of speech uh, where an adjective describes a characteristic. And so a characteristic of uh, our crown that we have received as a result of being born again of having placed our faith in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we are awarded the diadem, and it is an incorruptible crown that fadeth not away. But the scripture identifies four specific crowns, but when it uses the word crown, it's not translated from diadem, but from stephanos. The stephanos crown is an award that is given based upon achievement. Uh, it was prominent in the Olympic Games, in the Roman Games, in the Greek Games, in athletics, as well as in Greek theater. Uh, in the Thespian group, they awarded uh, uh, Stephanos crowns. A Stephanos crown was usually woven out of a laurel branch, and it was placed upon the head of the victor in competition or given on the basis of achievement. And the, the foliage or the beauty of that laurel wreath that was placed upon the head uh, varied from crown to crown. Uh, depending upon how much honor they wanted to bestow. Well, the scripture identifies that for you and I as born-again children of God, there is coming a time when we are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 
And uh, as we document that in scripture, it follows the rapture of the church, immediately following the rapture of the church, when Christ comes in the air, doesn't land upon the earth at that time, he comes in the air, and all the dead in Christ shall rise first. The scripture says he's going to bring the spirits of those who have died in Christ. He's going to bring their spirits with him because those spirits are in heaven with him now. He's going to bring them back with him. They are going to get a resurrection body, be united with that body. We're going to meet Christ in the air and we are ever going to be with the Lord after that. Immediately following our rapture, as we go into heaven, we go before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment of ourselves, but rather of our stewardship, our effectiveness as stewards of God. And there are four crowns that are going to be awarded at that ceremony to each believer. The foliage of each crown will be different. It will reflect how much honor, how much uh, uh, achievement they have made in those four areas. Well, with each of the crowns, as they were identified in Scripture, we identified them again uh, last week, but we'll identify them again this week. With each of the crowns, uh, we recognize they are each awarded on the basis of achievement in a particular area. And there are four areas that are identified in Scripture and as to which these crowns then are awarded. And they are given particular names and identified in various places in Scripture uh, that we will make reference to uh, again this evening to see if we can kind of get a handle on modern technology here today and going to the, can recall about where I was in my in my ramblings we were identifying the the Stephanos crowns and the reason for investigating this is because they relate to our living out our Christian life according to the Word of God. And uh, because these are the areas in which we are going to be um, evaluated, our work is going to be evaluated, and we are going to be given award on the basis of that, that really relates to our position in the millennial kingdom uh, and in the eternal kingdom. But these crowns that we are going to be given, we find out in the book of Revela Revelation that we actually cast them at the feet of Jesus. So we, we pay tribute to the grace of God uh, in that process. Now, I said the difference between the diadem and the stephanos. The diadem is the crown that you're given at salvation that makes you a joint heir together with Christ to rule and reign in not only the millennial kingdom, but the eternal kingdom. That is shared, we share that with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we are, when our salvation is in view, it's a diadem. But the Greek word that we're using for living out the design that God has for us in the Christian life is a Stephanos crown. And we've said that they, were, they are awarded on the basis of our achievement. And four particular areas that the scripture identifies uh, where that achievement is evaluated and where the crowns are going to be awarded. Uh, we have a crown uh, that is identified as the crown of righteousness, the crown of righteousness. And then we identify uh, beyond the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, 
And then in addition to the crown of glory, the crown of life. And then in addition to the crown of life is the crown of joy. Four specific awards that are going to be given to every believer they will vary in their appearance and their degree based on our faithfulness to the design that God has given each of us to live out in these four areas. The filling of the Holy Spirit, the development of the structure of spiritual maturity, the development of the faith rest life, and faithful stewardship. Now, we, by studying the scripture, we're able to understand when these crowns are mentioned as to the, the technique of living the Christian life that is involved in that. And so I want to quickly go through that again this evening to try to cement that in our thinking and uh, and then we will look a little further at application. We find that the Bible identifies then four different crowns that you and I as believers are going to receive at the judgment seat of Christ. Now we call it the judgment seat of Christ. The word bema is used in the Greek, the bema seat. It actually refers to a reviewing stand on a parade ground where the troops are being called to account and being inspected and given a, a commission and given commendation at the same time. So this is going to occur following the rapture of the church, and it's where you and I are going to be assigned our, our role in the millennial kingdom each one of us with our particular accountability based on what, how we have uh, lived out the design that God gave us. He does not call us to a task that he does not provide the resources for us to do. He gives us spiritual gifting and then spiritual provision, and we are stewards of that to manage that. will not be evaluated compared to anyone else, we will be evaluated compared to the design that he has given us and how faithful we have been in that. In these four areas, then, there is specific identification. So let's quickly review the crown of righteousness. Now, the word righteousness comes from the Greek word dikonosune, and it means that which conforms to the specifications of the blueprint. God has a blueprint for each of our lives, and we are going to be evaluated on how we have performed and whether or not we have complied with the blueprint. Well, the only way that we can be righteous before God, having been born with a sin nature, and having a natural tendency to sin, the only way that we can be righteous is to have God's righteousness credited to our account, and then for us to operate day by day under the righteous provision of God. The Holy Spirit is given to us so that we can live righteously according to the design of God. So the crown of righteousness is awarded on the basis of how well we have allowed the Holy Spirit to control our life. There is a conflict that goes on within the believer between the Holy Spirit and the old nature. And the Holy Spirit is jealous of us, and he wants the control of our life, and he wants our service and our performance for the Father, uh, but our old nature is against that and uh, bent on our own selfishness and our own perceived needs, and so we have to yield to the Holy Spirit 
and allow the Holy Spirit the control of our life if we are going to conform to the specifications of God's plan for our life. Now, we find this crown mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul is coming to the end of his life, the Apostle Paul. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance the crown of righteousness, based on how righteous we have been. And the only way we can be righteous is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So in, in order to conform to the blueprint that God has for our lives, we have to allow the Holy Spirit the control of our life. That's the only way we're going to conform to God's blueprint, is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Paul said, a crown of righteousness is laid up for those who love the appearance of Christ. Well, who's he talking about? We've said that each one of us is uh, has this crown of righteousness and it's going to be awarded on the basis of how righteous we have been, which is determined by how much we have allowed the Holy Spirit the control of our life from day to day, from time to time. Well, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So by constantly abiding in him, that is, allowing the Holy Spirit the constant control of our life, we will not be embarrassed or be shamed at his appearance. So abiding in Christ refers to the Spirit-filled life. It identifies our being controlled by the Holy Spirit, a life controlled by the Holy Spirit. We are commanded in Ephesians 5.18 to repeatedly be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that word filled is from the Greek word pleruste, which means saturated to the point of control. We are commanded to repeatedly be controlled by the Holy Spirit. He says in Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled or controlled with the Spirit. Now, the filling of the Holy Spirit is accomplished in our lives as believers at the moment of salvation. But when we sin, we take the control away from the Holy Spirit, and we allow the old nature to have control of our life. The means by which we give the control back to the Holy Spirit is the confession of sin. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in our study of the scripture and being controlled by the Holy Spirit, we understand that when we sin, it takes the control away when we confess our sin, it restores the control back to the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul says that it's the old nature on the inside of him that keeps working its way to the outside so that he does not perform what he purposes or desires to perform. Now, this in, in that passage, it follows the statement where Paul explains that the old nature is in constant conflict with the Holy Spirit, each seeking the control of our life. 
in the epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, it says, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So spiritual, being spiritual is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. To be carnal is to be controlled by your old sin nature. You are right now either spiritual or carnal. You're not a little bit of each. You are one or the other because either the Holy Spirit has control of your life right now or you're operating under the old nature. Now, if there's unconfessed sin in your life of which you are aware, then you're carnal and not spiritual. And so the need for 1 John 1, 9, in order that we might confess our sin, so that we might be placed again under the control of the Holy Spirit. It's only when we're controlled by the Holy Spirit that we're able to be righteous, to live righteously, that is, to conform to God's blueprint for our lives. It's only when we're controlled by the Holy Spirit that we have a capacity to understand the Word of God. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16 says, but the natural man, that word natural is in the Greek text, soulish, the soulish man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. According to the book of Galatians, <clears throat> chapter 5, verses 19 through 22, when you're carnal, your old sin nature is in control of your life, and the result is fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. But when you're spiritual, the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, and the fruit of the Spirit is evident in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. So the Bible teaches that we are believer priests. Now that means our confession is directly to God through our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't need to go to someone in an ecclesiastical order of priesthood. We are a priesthood ourselves. And in the quietness and privacy of our own mind, whenever there is sin there, we are to acknowledge that before God. Now remember the word confess. Where in the Bible are we told to be sorry for our sins or promise not to do it again? Uh, we can't live up to that promise. And so, or well, we won't live up to that promise, but we are told to confess it. Homo legeo is the Greek word. It means to name specifically what you did, to tell God specifically what you did. Oh, it's not that God doesn't know. He's omniscient. He knows. But it's that we need to make ourselves more aware because we'll find as we confess the sins that we commit, we have a pattern in our life that we've talked about with the old nature. We have a particular lust pattern, and we have a trend. And so we need to confess it, to tell God what we did, so that we are well aware of our besetting sin, the sin that does so easily beset us. And we're able to deal with that more effectively then. Before we sin, while it's in the area of temptation, we can flee from it and avoid it. So you're going to be given at the judgment seat of Christ a crown of righteousness. Remember the plumage, the foliage on that laurel wreath is going to be in proportion to the time that you have spent under the control of the Holy Spirit. So you need to review daily as you go through your life, 
whether or not the Holy Spirit's in control or whether you're allowing the old nature to control and visualize, if you will, that crown that is going to be given at the judgment seat of Christ, that you're going to have the privilege of being able to cast at the feet of Jesus at the appropriate time. That's the crown of righteousness. Now, the second crown is the crown of glory. Now, the technique for the uh, learning the crown of glory is the development of spiritual maturity in your life, your spiritual growth. Now, we know that because the word glory is translated from the Greek word doxos, and it means honor or esteem that is based upon character. Whenever we see the word glory in the scripture, Old Testament or New Testament, the emphasis is upon the character. If we're talking about the glory of God, we're talking about the character of God. If we're talking about the glory of man, we're talking about the character of man. And so the crown of glory is identified in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. Peter says, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. A crown of glory that fadeth not away. A crown awarded on the basis of character, honor and esteem that is given on the basis of your character as a child of God. Now, this character is acquired through our development of spiritual maturity. We put on a Christ likeness. We are to grow up into Christ in all things. We are to move from being newborn infants to adolescents to young adults and to mature adults. The scripture has set that forth, and in an earlier study a month or so ago, uh, we went through that process and talked about that, uh, and we will be trying to put all this together uh, for our thinking uh, as we continue with our study. So the crown of glory is going to be awarded upon your character. How much like Christ you have become in your life and are manifesting spiritual maturity in your life. Now, we've said there is a biblical structure that gives us the, the biblical information we need and the guidance that we need in order that we might develop this structure in our life. And you may remember we put up the chart. It has a foundation. And that foundation is made up of the personal relationship with Jesus Christ and the application of his teaching to our life, the Bible as a whole, and a personal relationship with the author of the Bible is the foundation for our living and developing spiritual maturity. And then the first floor is an understanding of grace, an orientation to grace. And the books of Romans and Galatians are crammed full of information that helps us in that area. As we become oriented to grace, we relax in our mental attitude. A mark of a believer is the degree to which he has relaxed in his mental attitude. And we include the book of Galatians and Hebrews as being key. Now, all the word of God is foundational for that. But these epistles have specific information uh, and guidance for us uh, in those areas. And then mastering the details of life. That is not being dependent upon our circumstance for happiness but finding happiness regardless of our circumstance. The book of Job is, uh, is good uh, biblical uh, fodder for developing that level of maturity in your life. And then the capacity to love, to love God, to love 
your spouse, to love uh, other believers, uh, the ability or capacity to love. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 has been identified as the love chapter. It really is chock full of information. And then the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, uh, are key as well. And then the, the top floor is the penthouse, uh, inner happiness, and uh, uh, the book of Philippians uh, is uh, key uh, to that particular room. But the, the word of God and the relationship with Christ and being controlled by the Holy Spirit, you're able to develop an understanding, a biblical knowledge that gives you a place to live in your Christian life and to develop maturity. Now, there's a roof over that of 7,000 plus promises that God has given us in time that we might live by them. Now, through the development of spiritual maturity, then our character changes and we receive glory. That is honor resulting from a good opinion that is based upon our character, which is developed through spiritual growth, or as we have said, through spiritual maturity. Now, through the development of spiritual maturity, then this change occurs in our life, and we move from the level of being a, a newborn babes in Christ to adolescence, and from adolescence to young adulthood, and then to being mature adults uh, in uh, his plan for our life. Now, to the degree that we develop that maturity, our crown of glory is going to be awarded. So some of us, the crown's going to be kind of skippy because we never really grew up in into Christ. Others uh, uh, of us uh, hopefully will relate to the biblical principles and would develop that growth in our life. And uh, so there will be a little more foliage uh, in that laurel wreath that is given to us at the judgment seat of Christ. So the greater our spiritual maturity, the greater the reward. But could I point out that the real benefit of these techniques is not that we might win a crown that we can cast at the feet of Jesus. But the real benefit is living life to its fullest today. As we live here upon the earth, to experience uh, what God has designed for us in this life. Too many Christians think they have to be miserable in this life, but they're going to have great pleasure and enjoyment in eternity. Uh, God has provided a means whereby we can have real joy and uh, fulfillment in this life as well. And so the as we develop maturity in our life, that becomes a, a part of the process. So the crown of righteousness, based upon our being controlled by the Holy Spirit, the crown of glory based upon our spiritual growth. There is a third crown, and that is the crown of life. Now, the crown of life is identified for us in James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive, notice, when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, in Revelation, it's uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 10, says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So the crown of life is awarded on the basis of how well we have lived life. That involves a number of concepts. It involves our, our being controlled by the Holy Spirit. It involves our uh, spiritual maturity. And now in this area, it involves that area of spiritual maturity. We talked about a relaxed mental attitude. 
Well, we refer to this living life as the faith rest technique. The technique for resting in faith in spite of our circumstances and situation. Now, it seems like that every time I'm called upon to teach this particular course, uh, this particular doctrine, uh, is one of those times when I need the reassurance myself. And, uh, of course, uh, from time to time, I've had individuals say, I really thank you for that sermon. It really spoke to me. I, it, it was just for me. And I generally have to remark, no, it was for me. I'm glad it fit you as well. But uh, most of our sermonizing is based upon our need uh, of assurance as we find it in the Word of God and of technique so that we might put it into operation in our, in our life. So he has a crown of life that is going to be given to you. You're going to receive one. And it's going to be based upon how well you lived life. Now, living the faith rest life requires our applying the Bible to our circumstances and our situation. The main purpose of the faith rest technique is to develop stability and security in our life Stability regardless of the circumstance or situation. The ability to trust God comes from our understanding and believing the promises, principles, and doctrines of the Bible as it's communicated to us in an understandable fashion. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Unto them is speaking of the Jews that got to the promised land but didn't go in. Remember, because of their lack of faith, they didn't go in. But the word preach did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. We can memorize promise after promise after promise. I have two granddaughters that are going through some circumstances right now. One with some difficulty in her life, the other with lymphoma cancer diagnosis and just started her first treatment last Thursday. And uh, I've been providing them with promises that are found in the Word of God and principles that are found in the Word of God. Uh, every morning, I the first thing I do is to drop them each a promise or a principle. And every evening, the last thing I do before I turn out the light at night is to drop them another promise or another principle uh, it's, I don't know how much good it's doing them, but it's doing me wonders because it reminds me of the faithfulness of God and the provision of God. As a matter of fact, each of them have in turn sent me back some promises. As a matter of fact, one of my, uh, the, the, the granddaughter that, that has the lymphoma, uh, she sent one the other day, and for some reason or other, she repeated it three times and must have hit the repeat button, and, and it came through on my phone three times. And she said, I don't know why I repeated it so long, uh, so many times. And I said, maybe you needed to be reminded of it. And she sent me a note back and said, yes, or you won, needed to be reminded of it. We do need to be reminded from time to time of the promises and the principles and the technique. Over 7,000 that relate to us in living out our design as Christians that are found in the Word of God, and then the basic principles. So how well we apply those. You know, we can quote them all day long, but if we don't learn to sit down in them, and relax 
in them. They're of no value to us. They're just words. I, uh, I frequently have referred to Romans 8.28 as my easy chair. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I need to sit down in that promise every day. And sometimes I get up in it, but I, through the day, I let the, the circumstances and situations interfere. I kind of had a little struggle with that today. I've been needing employment. When you are going to be 81 in July, not everybody is jumping up to hire you. Now, while they legally can't discriminate against you because of age, uh, there is that discrimination that goes along. But trying to find a job that's suitable with my Bible studies and my teaching ministry and uh, uh, allow me to have proper uh, work schedule so that, that we can have proper income uh, is, is a challenge. And uh, I had interviewed for a job driving a delivery truck. I've driven trucks from from panel all the way to 18 wheelers and pulling doubles. Haven't ever pulled triples because I most of that was out of California. Up here they pull three trailers. I haven't haven't done that, but I pulled the doubles in the 11 Western states. So there was a job for uh, a restore here, the uh, human habitat uh, uh, store uh, for delivery driver. Well, I went down for the interview. I got called for interview, and the interviewer was a pastor, a local pastor's wife. Well, what more could you ask for? I thought I had a door in. But she said, I'll send you an email. That was a week ago this past Monday, and I haven't heard from her. But then there came uh, along a call from the local resort, Coeur d'Alene Resort. It's a big fancy resort, and I'll uh, operates year round. Uh, they needed four drivers, two part time and two full time drivers, to pick up people at the airport and take people back to the airport. Well, the the hours and things would have been ideal for me, and I reminded God of that. Uh, not only would it provide. Uh, uh, enough income for us to take care of our outgo, but uh, uh, there would be tips uh, along with that as well. And uh, I, I thought I had convinced the Lord that that was the job for me. And uh, the man doing the interview said, I will, I'll be off on uh, Monday, but he said, I'll call you on Tuesday. And I, in our conversation, I said, it's the full-time position I'm interested in. And he said, that's the one I want you for. Those were his words. That's the one I want you for. Well, I waited up until about two o'clock this afternoon. And then I got a telephone call. And he said, uh, I really appreciate you coming in and interviewing for the job. And I really enjoyed talking with you. And, uh, and I appreciated your qualifications, but we have hired four from our staff here that were already employed at the resort that have applied for the job, and we have given it to them. I'm going to pass your resume around to the other departments, but uh, we've filled those positions. So I said, Lord, what's going on here? You know our need, our monthly need, and uh, here was an ideal situation. As a matter of fact, I said out loud, well, Lord, I don't know where to go from here. I said, I keep turning in applications and resumes and nothing seems to happen. You know, I'll do what you want me to do. Just let me know what you want me to do. Give me something. I barely got that out of my mouth and the phone rang. And so because I just talked to the Lord, when I answered, I said, yes, Lord. 
<laughs> they hung up on me. <laughs> I hope it wasn't the Lord that hung up. It was an 888 number, so I, I speculated it was not from the Lord. But uh, because I just was talking to him, I just answered, yes, Lord, what is it? Well, they hung up. We do need to be reminded of the promises and the provisions of God. Has he ever failed me in 81 years? Not a single time. Has he ever done it the way that I suggested? Not that I recall. <laughs> has, he, has he given me more uh, uh, than, than I really needed and give me the abundance to operate out of? No. But I, I missed eating meals because of him, not supplying my need. Only four days in my whole life, and that was freshman in college, have I gone without food. He's been faithful. And by the way, that didn't hurt me any. And I made up for it because I was speaking at a banquet uh, at the end of that week down in San Diego, I, I took two other of the students who were having a little rough time financially with me because it was, a, it was not a banquet, it was a barbecue. And they messed up and didn't get the invitations out. And they had, they had 36 fryer chickens cut in half on the grills when they discovered there was only going to be about 10 people there. And so I helped them out as best I could. I ate three friars that night. And uh, so he did give me an abundance. It was all at once. Uh, but I did manage to take one home as well. And the other boys that were with me uh, filled themselves and, and took a chicken home with them as well. God has always met our needs. But he doesn't meet them the way we ask. He doesn't meet them the way we suggest. And uh, so we need to be reminded of the promises of God. We are going to be given a crown of life based upon how well we have rested in faith in the promised provisions that he's made. Now, he led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He took them up to the Red Sea and let Pharaoh's army catch up before he parted the waters and took them through on dry land and then closed up the waters and wiped out the Egyptians. He fed them daily with manna. He opened up the rock in the wilderness, the split rock of Horeb, to give them water for them and their cattle and all of the sheep and everything else that was with them. He fought their battles. For them. And yet when they got to the promised land, they didn't go in. You remember they sent some spies into the land and they spied out the land and they came back and they said, man, it is a land that flows with milk and honey. But we're like grasshoppers in the sight of the people there. They're giants that live there. There's no way we can take it. Well, God hadn't told them they had to take it. God had said, I will go ahead of you and drive them out. You just follow me. But they didn't go. And so they weren't allowed to go in because of their unbelief. Instead, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They could have lived in houses that they hadn't built and harvested crops that they hadn't planted and had to fruit from the orchards that someone else had planted, they could have rested in that new land, but because of unbelief, they didn't. So the writer of Hebrews warns us, there is a danger, though God has given us his promises and given us his principles, there's a danger that we do not enter into the rest because of unbelief. Any anxiety that we have, any frustration that we have, any anger that we have, because God hasn't done it the way that we thought he ought to have done it, we simply rob ourselves. And not only 
Are we going to find a skimpy crown of life at the judgment seat? But we're going to find misery and frustration and anger and ulcers and indigestion and in our life here. There is a crown of life that God is going to award us, and it's going to be on the basis of how well we have developed this faith rest life, of how much we have rested in the faith that God is faithful and that he will provide what he has promised to provide. So we have to know the promises before we can rest in them. So that means we need to spend time in his word. We have to know the principles in order that we might apply them. So that means we have to spend time in his word. The crown of life is going to be given on the basis of how well we have rested in those promises and those principles that he has provided for us. There's a fourth crown, a fourth crown that is going to be given out at the judgment seat of Christ. And every believer is going to receive one the fullness of it and the beauty of it is going to be dependent upon how well you have been steward of what he has given you. There is a crown of joy, the crown of joy that is going to be given out. Now, the crown of joy is acquired through our faithful stewardship to God. At the moment of salvation, God has given us stewardship responsibility. A steward is an administrator. God has given us at salvation at least one spiritual gift, sometimes a package of gifts. He has given us a designed ministry, not laid out clearly for us most of the time, but revealed by the Holy Spirit from day to day in our life. He has given us resources, all the resources we need to live out the design that he has given us for our life. All of those resources are provided for us. And we are going to be held accountable at the judgment seat of Christ as to how well we have managed what he has given us. What he has given us relates in three areas, time, ability, and possession. All of our time belongs to him. He is our creator. He is the one who has given us new life, spiritual life in Christ. And each one of us have 24 hours a day in which we are to live out that design. He has given us ability, uniquely, distinctly. No two of us are exactly the same when it comes to the provision that God has made for our lives. He has crafted us uniquely and given us unique abilities. We are going to be evaluated on the basis of the gifting that he has given. How well we've managed our time and the gifting that, his, that the Holy Spirit has given us concerning our abilities, how well we have managed that, and how we have invested our time with those abilities. And then possessions. Well, each of us have varying degrees of possessions, but we are accountable for what we do have. There's quite a debate that goes on in the church concerning tithing. Are we supposed to give a tenth of everything that we receive? Are we supposed to give that to God? Is that God? So when we read the Old Testament and read in the book of Malachi, uh, it says that, that we have robbed God in tithes and offerings. So there are many preachers and teachers that teach that 
right off the top of everything that we get, we are uh, a tenth of that belongs to God. Well, as I study the scripture, I think they missed the mark on that. Because as I study the scripture, we are identified as bond slaves of Jesus Christ. We belong to him as his stewards. We don't own anything ourselves. As a matter of fact, a slave can't own anything. Any property that he has belongs to his master. So we don't own anything God does. And everything that we have is what he has entrusted to our care and made us stewards of. So we are stewards of everything that we own materially. All of our possessions belong to him. So does a tenth belong to him? No. A hundred percent belongs to him. So does that mean every Sunday morning we put a hundred percent in the offering plate? No. We're stewards. Remember, we are to manage that which he has given us. What about the principle of 10% the time? Well, we find there is a basic principle even before the law was established and long before Malachi's day that there was a principle established of a 10% giving, being given directly to God. But all of it belongs to him. And we are as countable for the 90% as we are for the 10%. And we are accountable as to how we've spent any of that and how we have utilized it. Now, for most of us, the majority of it is spent on our living, our eating, and uh, having a place to live, uh, meeting the, the financial obligations that we encounter as a result of being humanoids living here on planet Earth. And... Uh, uh, the majority of that is involved in our own livelihood, but it's how we proportion that and utilize that, that we are going to receive the crown of joy. Now, not just on remember our possessions, but our time. How well do we manage our time? 24 hours a day. I never seem to have enough time. I generally make the statement, I just don't have enough time to do that. And a statement about time is really a statement about priorities. What we are actually saying is that's not a priority with me. So we need to evaluate our priorities as it relates to our time, as it relates to our abilities, and as it relates to our material things, our possessions. At the judgment seat of Christ, the crown of joy is going to be given. Now, how do we know that the crown of joy relates to our stewardship? Listen to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Normally, I don't have to worry about that because it was dark when I came in and, and I turn on the light. Uh, to get started, but the sun has not gone down here yet. What time is it? It's eight or seven, ten minutes after seven, and the sun hasn't gone down. I live a little bit north of the, equi the equator up here in northern Idaho. Uh, there are some days when it's still light out here at 10 o'clock at night, and it's heading that direction, so I forgot to turn on the light and uh, now, now I've got it on so we'll uh, I'll be a better steward of that so this crown of joy is identified in Galatians 2 20 Paul said I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, we're not our own. As a matter of fact, 
uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So our stewardship is based upon the fact that the life that we live is Christ. We are to live it out for him. Now, that involves our being able to make a living, our being able to work at various things, to have income, and uh, then our management of that as well. Uh, but how we use the 24 hours in each day. Now, I said we all have the same number of hours in the day. Each one of us have 24 hours in the day. We don't have the same number of days, nor do we have the same number of months or even of years. The scripture says that uh, the span of a man's life is three score ten. Uh, that would be 70 years as the span of man's life. But we also find that the scripture says, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be longer upon the face of the earth. We also identify with passages of scripture that talk about the sin unto death. So we don't all live to be 70 years old and then check out. I would have checked out almost 11 years ago. God has designed for each one of us. But we do have the same number of hours each day. And so we need to be good stewards of our daily time, how much we spend uh, serving him and utilizing that time to honor and glorify him. We also then have, as I said, different spiritual gifts. We have different abilities in the kingdom. And I remember as a kid uh, going to camp that, that in the summer camp situation, the emotion around the bonfire and the emotion of the preachers preaching and, and uh, of kids uh, uh, coming to know the Lord and, and wanting to serve the Lord, uh, that there were a lot of young boys that so surrendered to preach uh, at they while they were at camp, and girls that surrendered to be missionaries, be a preacher or missionary. That seemed to be the way to serve God. And I grew up with some of those that had guilty conscience because they did not follow through and become preachers or go to the mission field as a missionary. But my experiences show me that the majority of those were not called to preach to begin with. They were just desirous of serving God and being, doing everything that they could for God. And that seemed to be the alternative, be a missionary or be a preacher. And uh, so they made that kind of commitment when God had really not gifted them uh, in the, that particular area. Uh, our spiritual gifts vary from individual to individual. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, beginning with verse 6, it says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So we have at least one spiritual gift, and we are accountable to God for that gift, how we have used it. Now, there's a lot of overlap in the gifts. There are many of us who have been given the gift of teaching. And we are responsible to God for our ministry of teaching. But our gifts vary from individual to individual. Not everybody that has the gift of teaching has the same ability, has a, the same opportunity, the same calling, 
the same place to serve. So we are accountable to God for what God has given us and what he has assigned us to do. That means we, yes, if we're going to teach, we need to make sure that we are teaching where we're supposed to be teaching, what we're supposed to be teaching, and the way that God has given us to teach. Each one of us, some with the gift of helps, come along and work behind the scenes. Others of us are in more public position. But we are going to be evaluated not against each other, but against how we have lived out our particular role. I'm reminded of the organist, the great concert organist that was quite a performer on the organ that held a concert and uh, packed the house as people came from all over to hear this man play the organ, his great ability on the keyboard. And after he had played his first number, the audience uh, broke into applause and he stood and bowed before them. And as he bowed over, he noticed behind him that one of the stagehands had come out behind the curtain and he was bowing along with this great concert organist. He turned around and said, what are you doing out here? They came to hear me play. You get back behind the curtain where you belong. Well, he sat down at the keyboard and he came down upon the keyboard for the second number and it was deathly quiet. There was not a sound. He came down upon it again and there was no sound because the stagehand pumped the billows that put air in the organ that made it work. After he had tried three times, the stagehand came out and bowed before the audience and took a standing ovation because without him, the great concert artist was nothing. He had to have the help of the guy pumping the bellows to get air into the organ for the music to come out. It was a standing ovation, and rightly so, because those who work behind the scenes don't get much thanks or much attention, but it's those that are in more prominent for roles of leadership or of public ministry that get that. We're going to be evaluated not on the basis of others, but how well we have done the job that God gave us. And then, as I've said, to manage the, the material things that God has given us, the possessions. So there are four crowns. And these four crowns, are going to be awarded at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ comes immediately following the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is when Christ comes in the air to receive his bride, the church. Those who have been saved from the day of Pentecost in 30 AD till the time that he comes in the air. That figures the church age as we have identified it. And those in the church age are going to be the bride of Christ, but we're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ to receive these crowns and be awarded. But as I've indicated, and I want to emphasize again, the real value is not the crown itself. For that, we are going to be grateful that we have something to cast at the feet of Jesus. But the real value is living life here upon the earth. The Holy Spirit wants to control our life. But our old nature is in rebellion against that. And so we need to recognize the consistent need of the confession of sin in order that the Holy Spirit 
might control our life. When the Holy Spirit controls us, we are righteous. Now we have a righteousness that relates to our eternal salvation, that is Jesus Christ, but we are, our gar wedding garments are going to be our righteousnesses that how well we've conformed to God's plan for our life. And uh, that crown of righteousness is going to be awarded on that basis. How did it go today? How much time did you log under the control of the Holy Spirit? Or is there yet unconfessed sin in your life that means the old nature is in control and you're carnal rather than spiritual, and there's the need to acknowledge that before him? For some of us, that means several times a day. <laughs> we may need to pause and identify that sin that we might be restored to fellowship and under the control of the Holy Spirit. If the crown of righteousness was based upon how well you've done today in living under the control of this Holy Spirit, how full does your crown look? The crown of glory, remember, is awarded on the basis of character. Your development of spiritual maturity in your life. Your growing up into Christ. As the scripture identifies newborn infants, adolescents, young adults or mature adults, where are you in that growth pattern? God has provided his word as a lamp to our feet and light to our path. He has given us the instruction that we might develop a framework of Bible doctrine so that we can understand and relate to grace. We can develop a relaxed mental attitude. We can master the circumstances of life rather than them controlling us. We can have a capacity to love and we can have inner happiness or joy. Over 7,000 promises to protect us. Are you operating from that basis or have you been out of that structure, not living according to it, not following the guidelines and instruction of it? We need to recognize then that in order for us to experience the fullness, we're going to have to be obedient to him, and we're going to have to grow up into Christ. The crown of glory will be given on the basis of how you have developed your Christian character in living like Jesus. The crown of life then on your relaxation in the Lord, your relaxed mental attitude in that faith rest where you believe God and you recognize that he is causing all things to work together for your good and you're resting in that, and you're operating on that basis, rather than being frustrated or worrying or having anger, uh, you are relaxed in that. The crown of life is going to be awarded at the judgment seat of Christ. The crown of joy then relates to your stewardship, your time, your ability, and your possessions. How well are you managing those things for God? How faithful have you been unto him with it? Now, while it's going to be great at the judgment seat of Christ for each one of us to be given each one of those crowns, four crowns that are going to be awarded to us, and at the appropriate time, we will be able to say to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, here are the crowns that I have acquired based upon your grace and your provision for me. But the real joy comes in living day by day and having the Holy Spirit control us in our developing that spiritual growth so that we are growing up into him in uh, 
having that relaxation in our life so that we are at rest as we claim his promises. And then in our faithful stewardship to him in service. Our joy is dependent upon our willingness to apply these things, these principles in our life. So I trust that you will review the material that we've gone through again this evening and trying to emphasize and drive home the provision that God has made us so that we might have uh, the fullness of life, that we might experience it in our daily walk, and that he might have honor and glory but that we might have peace and joy that we might be at rest rather than wandering out there in the wilderness as the children of Israel, that we'll be obedient and follow God, that we can experience then the fullness of all that he has provided for us in his magnificent way. Now, last week, there was a question raised uh, relative, uh, I believe Martin is, is the one that raised the question, and uh, it related uh, to uh, whether or not we are to be uh, applying all that is said to Israel, whether that relates to us uh, or not, uh, or whether there is a distinction uh, that is found then uh, between Israel and the church. So I, I said I needed to talk to Pastor Carlos uh, about that to see what was, uh, what was actually going on uh, and whether he needed me to address that. And uh, so we talked, and he said it would be good for me to address it and talk about the difference of it. I know that, uh, that Ken uh, is, uh, uh, his teaching is based upon uh, the dispensational uh, structure. And, uh, and Pastor Carlos uh, is too. Uh, sometimes uh, we, we make statements that, that don't fit what we come out the way we want them to come out. Uh, the, the church is divided today uh, between these two theological views. Uh, there are those who uh, teach that uh, Israel uh, was replaced by the church and that uh, what God said to Israel applies to the church uh, and there are others who teach, no, there is a distinction between what God was doing with Israel and what God is doing with the church. And so the whole of Christianity is, di is divided over this issue. Uh, those that hold the view that uh, Israel is no longer in the plan of God it's kind of broad spectrum of differing views relative to that specifically. Uh, but the, the predominant uh, identification with that uh, is what we call Calvinism, the doctrine of Calvinism. Well, what is the doctrine of Calvinism? Well, it's based upon the teaching of one John Calvin, who was a theologian in generations gone by. And uh, according to, to his teaching, uh, we as individuals do not have an option of being Christian or non-Christian. According to Calvin's position, God elected or selected in eternity past those he was going to save, and he saves them apart from their free will. Uh, they don't really have a choice in the matter. And others he does not save because he did not elect them. 
and they couldn't be saved if they wanted to because God has not elected them. But the view goes beyond that. It goes beyond that concept of whether or not we have free will uh, or whether we are predestined apart from our free will. There are other aspects of the doctrine that's really uh, divergent from those of us who hold that we do have free will. Now, frequently, you will hear individuals ask, and I've been asked many times, are you a Calvinist or are you an Armenian? Well, what do they mean by that? Well, there was one James Arminus who held a position that we have free will and that we can make a choice whether or not to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. But James Arman has held some other doctrine that I sure don't want to be identified with. And so I generally say I am neither a Calvinist nor an Armenian. I am a Biblicist. Well, that usually generates the question, and what is a Biblicist? Well, a Biblicist is one who follows the Bible, not John Calvin nor James Arminus, but what does the Bible say about these? Because there were some areas that John Calvin was all right on. There were some areas that he was desperately in contradiction to Scripture. There were some areas that James Arminus was right in, but there are some areas that he desperately was contrary to Scripture. So we should never align ourselves with a man in order to describe our theology. Our theology should be based, and the word theology is theos, God, and ology, study, the study of God. Our theology should be determined by what the Bible says. And... Of course, there's different interpretations. There's different understandings as to what the Bible says. And that's why it's so important uh, that I address this issue and that we set up some parameters for where we are coming from in our teaching and really the teaching that you're exposed to uh, at the C Street uh, Family Plan Ministry. Uh, is based on uh, a dispensational approach. Now, let me, let me see if I can uh, uh, lay down some basic guidelines for us uh, to begin with uh, in this period of time this evening, and then we will we'll follow this uh, and pick up on it a little later. I remember the first time... Uh, I was exposed to the concept. I had a man walk up after one of my sermons and say, so you're a dispensationalist. I looked at the man and I said, is that good or bad? <laughs> and he said, well, I think it's good. Other people would think it's bad. I said, can you explain to me why you think I'm a dispensationalist? He said, well, because you teach that there's a difference in God dealing with Israel and God dealing with the church. And you believe in your preaching, you've said that you believe that the Bible is to be taken literal. And you believe that God had a higher purpose in the creation of man uh, other than just to satisfy his loneliness. And I said, well, you're right on those three counts. I believe that there is a distinction in the way that God dealt with Israel and the way that God deals with the church. I further believe in a literal approach to Scripture. And, yes, I believe that man was created to settle an angelic conflict that's older than man. And God's capable of keeping himself company. He didn't create man because he was lonely. 
He created man to settle a conflict between Satan and the fallen angels and God and his elect angel. So I guess if that fits, then I'm a dispensationalist. I had a lady come. I was counseling her husband. She, she had made the arrangements. My husband needs some Bible counseling. So she made an appointment for him to come in and, and talk with me. And the second week, when he came back, she came with him. And she said, before you continue to counsel my husband, I need to know, are you a dispensationalist? And I said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, well, I don't want you counseling my husband then. I said, well, we got part of the problem that the husband needs counseling already identified then. Uh, we might need to do some counseling with you. I said, are you not a dispensationalist? And she said, oh, no, I'm not a dispensationalist. And I said, well, tell me, did you offer five daily sacrifices today? Well, of course not. That's ridiculous. And I said, you say, of course not. That's ridiculous. Does not the Bible say that they would offer five daily sacrifices every day, a burnt offering? a meal offering, a peace offering, a sin offering, and a trespass offering. Oh, that's for the Old Testament. Oh, I said, so at least you are a two-point dispensationalist. You believe that that's no longer applicable. No, she said, that's no longer applicable. Well, then where do you draw the line as to what is applicable and what is not applicable? And her answer was like most that I find, even, even Christian, even some dispensationalists, who say the Old Testament and the New Testament. Oh, okay. Well, if we go the Old Testament and the New Testament, where are the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're in the New Testament, aren't they? Well, yes. When did Christ die on the cross? At the beginning of the Gospels, before they began, or at the end of the Gospels? Well, at the end of the Gospels. Oh, when did the church begin? Did it begin with the calling of Peter and James and John, the first disciples? Some, ple some people believe it does, that it did. It began at that time. I believe the church began on the day of Pentecost in 30 AD, following the ascension of Christ to heaven. So, we, we need to at least understand as we're going to handle the Word of God, as we are going to study the Word of God, we, we need to have an understanding of where we're coming from and how we are relating to that. So let me see if I can uh, lay some groundwork tonight, and I'm looking for the outline material that I had uh, here. I've got, uh, I've got lots of outline, <laughs> but I was looking for the one that I sent you, uh, sent to, to Ken, and um, some way or other I have mislaid it. Uh, this is kind of an introduction tonight, so I'll just kind of wing it and uh, see if we can... Uh, can get at least the introduction uh, done so that we can identify with it. What's the real difference between covenant or Calvinism? It goes also under the head of reform theology or covenant theology and dispensational theology. Well, we, we began by understanding what the word dispensation means. It's a Bible word, and so we need to examine it and see just exactly uh, what it means and uh, how we can uh, relate to it. Let me, uh, let me see what I did with that outline so I follow what you are, what you are doing.
this will put us on the, on the same page, at least for the few minutes that we have this evening. And uh, the, uh, we, we have identified dispensations as God's outline of time and his appointment as stewards. Now, we have done that based upon what we find in Scripture. So let me kick off this introduction tonight. I'll give you a few minutes for, for questions and answers not relative to this because we'll come back to this, uh, but for, uh, for other things. I said in the study guide that I sent that it's not a simple manner to identify dispensationalism. But a lot of different definitions have been given, but most of them really don't, don't cover all the facets that we find related to dispensationalism. We might say that a dispensation is a period of human history expressed from a divine viewpoint. A period of human history expressed from a divine viewpoint. But that definition is lost to those that don't make the distinction between human viewpoint, the way man thinks, and divine viewpoint, the way God thinks. Dispensationalism is a term that's applied to the view of biblical interpretation, which understands time as having been divided into various periods in which man's obedience to God's revelation is tested. Now, a careful study of the Bible reveals that increasing degrees of revelation have occurred in various periods of time. Adam and Eve didn't have a great deal of doctrine compared to what we have today. Those periods of time have been identified as dispensations. Now, there are three Greek words in the Greek New Testament that are key to our understanding. All three of these words are found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, Paul's writing, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now here's where Paul says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may prevent every, or present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Wherefore I also labor, striving according to his working, that worketh in me mightily. The three Greek words that are used here in the text that I want to address. The first word is oikonomia, and it is translated dispensation in verse 25. We saw, wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God. That's the Greek word oikonomia. The second word is ionon, and uh, it's translated ages in verse 26. The third Greek word is gneon, and it's translated generations in verse 26. Oikonomian, translated dispensations, literally means stewardship or administrative responsibility. Stewardship or administrative responsibility. 
Now, it emphasizes the way God works. God works through stewards, through administrators. Adam and Eve were the first administrators. And then we move down through the course of time, and we have seen him change administration, administrators. And so the administration changes. A dispensation is an administration. It is where God has appointed stewards to administer his revelation. Now, the second word we said was ionon and is translated ages, and it designates a period of time and emphasizes the time frame for God's plan. He has administrators, and each of the administrators have a time slot, a time period that they are appointed for. And then we have the word Ganeon, and it's translated generation, and it identifies the people of a certain period of time, the stewards, the administrators. So you have an administration, and then you have a, a period of time for that administration, and then you have the people that are the administrators in that period of time. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, it says, Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. Now, the word worlds in that verse is translated from ionon, the same word that we had translated in the passage in Colossians that was translated ages. So in one verse, it's translated ages. In another, word, another uh, passage, it's translated worlds. It is not cosmos, that's worlds. It's aeon, it's ages, and it so ought to be identified. So the writer is saying that the ages were framed by God. The word that is translated framed is the Greek word katarkiste, and it means outline. So in other words, God outlined various ages at some point in eternity past before they actually began. So that's where we're going to look at the fact that God outlined various periods of time for the future of time itself, beginning with Adam and ending with the destruction of this heaven and this earth at the end of the millennial reign. We'll find that God outlined seven distinct periods of time and that he identifies the stewards during that period of time. And the key for our understanding this is that the scripture that relates to that particular period of time and to those administrators, how does that relate to us? We will find that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We will observe that God's plan of salvation has been by grace through faith in the coming Messiah and then the Messiah who has come, that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ from Adam to the end of time. God has not changed the method of salvation. That's always been by grace through faith. But he has changed the way that he deals with individuals and he has specific scripture that relates to them. So we need to understand that in order that we might rightly divide the word of truth. Because there are passages that do not relate directly to us. And I said to that young lady whose husband, she did not want me to counsel any further, I said, if you didn't offer a burnt offering, a meal offering, a peace offering, a sin offering, and a trespass offering, 
then you believe in at least two different periods of time in which God has worked with man and, and which he has revealed. And if you are not obedient to that, there must be a reason. And of course, the reason is because that was fulfilled by Christ's death, life, death, and resurrection, and we don't do that anymore. But how much of that relates? Does it break off between Malachi and Matthew? Or does it start with, with Acts chapter 2, where the church age began? What are the ages uh, that are identified? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that we'll see there was an age of innocence, beginning with the creation of Adam until the fall. He lived in a time of innocence. There was an age of conscience that began when he ate of the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that continued to the flood in Noah's day. That there was an age of civil government that began after the flood, when God segregated the people into nations, nationalities, and races of people and governments. He did that at the Tower of Babel, you recall. That, can, that began at the Tower of Babel, and it ended when God called out a man by the name of Abram, whose name was changed Abraham, and uh, he gave Abraham a promise to him, to Abraham, and his descendants through Isaac. We moved into an age of promise. And then that continued until Mount Sinai at the Exodus when he gave the law. And he appointed the children of Israel as his stewards. And that continued up until the day of Pentecost in 30 AD, 10 days after the ascension of Christ, 40 days after uh, the resurrection Christ ascended. And then 10 days later, we come to the day of Pentecost that marks the end of the Jewish administration and the beginning of the church age. So that's in Acts chapter 2 and continuing. The church age continues until the rapture. But the age of Israel, the, the Jewish age, they God owed them seven years when the church age began. What do you mean God owed them seven years? Well, he promised to Daniel that when they went back from the Babylonian captivity, that there they would have 490 years as the Jews to complete their administration. First period of time would be 49 years. They'd be trouble. But at the end of the 49 years, there would be peace, and they would be settled in the land. And then at 483 years, they would kill the Messiah. <laughs> yeah, Daniel prophesied 483 years from the signing of the decree to allow the children of Israel to go back from the Babylonian captivity to finish out their work, 483 of those years, and then they would kill the Messiah, and then there would be a final seven years. Well, we'll see as we look at the calendar, all of those things came to pass on the exact day, at the exact hour, as Daniel had prophesied but the seven years are yet to be fulfilled. Where do the seven years come in? God promised them seven more years. Well, he's going to take the church out of the world. Remember at the rapture, he's going to take the church out. And as he takes the church out, there are how many Jews? 144,000 Jews that become believers following the rapture of the church. 12,000 from 12 tribes of Israel. They, that's the last seven years. How long is the tribulation? Seven years. How much time do the Jews have as administrators? Seven years. Who are the administrators in that seven years of tribulation? The Jews. So we are going to see how God works all that out. Now, it's important because we will not rightly divide the word of truth 
unless we understand where these administrations change, the scripture that was given in that period of administration, the responsibility that they have, and how it relates to us today. So we're, we're going to look at that. Now we got a minute or two. I just wanted to get that introduction um, out to you uh, in response to Martin's question. What God has said to Israel does not relate directly to the church. As a matter of fact, we'll see that, the, that Israel is not in the new heaven with the church. Israel is on the new earth in the eternal kingdom. And we are going to rule and reign over that. So it's important that we understand that. Now, there may be a question that somebody had saved up and I've used up our time. So let me take just a minute. Anybody with a question tonight? before we end it and then next week branch out into this study. No question. I'm I made it so confusing. Yes. Yes. Let you know that they were here and they, they send their, uh, they say hi. Okay, thank you. I saw them come in and, and then leave. Thank you for sharing that. All right, let's close with prayer then. And next week, um, we're, we're going to go at a pace that you can keep up with this. So don't be confused. There's, there's, unless I get you confused, I can't straighten you out. <laughs> so there's a method to my madness. Okay, but I think it is important that we understand the distinction and how to distinguish what relates directly to us. All scripture, all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So don't misunderstand that. But not all of it is directly applicable to us. The principles are established, but the application is different. So we will explore that. Let us pray. Our Father, we give you thanks for your great love wherewith you loved us. That even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the word becoming flesh and living among us. Help us to become good students of your word. And give us, we pray, a surrendered will to your spirit that we might apply what we discover in your word to our lives day by day. As we give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. I'll visit.